Once you have a request, you're ready to send those requests to QuickBooks using QBXMLRP or QBXMLRP2. You would simply call process request and you provide the session ticket that was returned to you in begin session and the request XML that you want to send. Very straightforward. You get back an XML string as a response and you'll be responsible for parsing that. If QuickBooks has a problem parsing the request or something else goes wrong, you'll get back an H result. And you need to be prepared to catch that H result and provide a message to your user that's appropriate. If the request is parsed successfully, then you'll get back XML. And that XML will indicate whether the request was successful or whether QuickBooks encountered a business logic error, such as uh, adding an invoice referencing a customer that didn't exist. If you're using QBFC, sending a request to QuickBooks is very similar. You get back a response message set, having sent a request message set in the do requests function. The request message set is the QBFC object containing the full content of the request, and the response message set is the full content of the response. QBFC does some logical verification of your request first, so you may get an H result as QBFC spares you the call to QuickBooks first. Having logically verified your request, it will send that request on to QuickBooks. And in rare cases, typically QuickBook, QBFC will catch the problem before it gets to QuickBooks. But in rare cases, you may get an H result from QuickBooks. Again, you need to handle those. Or finally, you'll get back that response, and it'll have a status for success or a QuickBooks logical error like we talked about before. When you're all done, you're ready to end the session. If you're using QBXMLRP, it's just end session providing the ticket. And QBFC, QBFC manages the ticket internally, so it's just end session with no parameters. That closes the company file for your application. If the QuickBooks UI is still live, or another application is connected to QuickBooks, then the company file won't actually close, but it does close for your application. It'll free the resources that your application may have used in connecting to that file. Finally, you're ready to close the connection to QuickBooks. You call close connection, and that indicates your intent to drop that COM pointer. And finally, you need to clear your COM pointer, because as long as you have that COM pointer live, QuickBooks can't close. So let's look at that framework with QBXML RP. As I said before, you want to be prepared to trap H results. In Visual Basic, they'll be thrown as an exception. So I have on error, go to error, handle error. And the handle error is down below, and we'll provide a message box or something like that. We create our request processor object. We open connection. We uh, create our ticket. And we call begin session. In this case, I'm just going to connect to whatever is currently open in QuickBooks. We'll go ahead and do whatever we're going to do. And when we're done, we end the session, providing that ticket, close connection, and clear our COM pointer. With QBFC, very similar. In this case, the top level object is a QB session manager. So we create that session manager. We call its open connection method. Again, uh, we're using an empty string, and our sample QBFC is the app name that's going to appear in QuickBooks. We begin the session. And in this case, again, the, the currently open company file with whatever mode it's currently open in. We do what we're going to do. We end the session. We close the connection. And we clear our COM pointer. Very straightforward, simple, and easy to use. So now we're ready to get into a demo. We're actually going to connect Microsoft Access to QuickBooks in order to populate an access table with customer data. All right, so here we are in Microsoft Access. And what I've done for this demo is just create a very simple table in Access. Five columns, the customer ID, and that's going to take the list ID from QuickBooks, which is assigned by QuickBooks to each um, customer in the list, and is QuickBooks' unique identification for that customer. Then the name of the customer, their phone number, their email address, and the QB edit sequence, which we'll talk about later, and would be important if we wanted to modify data using Access to modify QuickBooks. And just so that we can actually make it do something, I've created a simple little form with a button to look, get customers from QuickBooks. So I'm going to go ahead and click this button. And that brings up QuickBooks. 
And immediately I'm giving that, given that authorization dialog we talked about earlier. And I see here that the application calls itself the SDK Essentials Sample. It does, in fact, have a certificate because the application connecting to it is Microsoft Access, which has been signed by Microsoft. And I can tell it whether I want to allow the application to access Social Security numbers or not. In this case, I don't need them, so I'm not going to check the box. And I'm going to say, yes, I want to allow this application connect. And again, as the administrator, I can choose whether I want to allow the connection this time or always. So I'll go ahead and say yes always. And we'll come back to access. And I'm going to reload this table. And there are all the customers that came over from QuickBooks. Very straightforward, the customer ID from QuickBooks, their name, their phone number, their email address, and the edit sequence. So how did that actually work? Let's take a look at the code. So I have a very simple event procedure there. And I have uh, grabbed the database from uh, Access, the Access DB. That's so that I can actually call um, a SQL execute call later. And then we get into the actual QuickBooks specific part. I'm creating that session manager, so I'm using QBFC. And one thing I'm going to need to do if I'm using QBFC or even if I'm using QBXMLRP is I need to set the references to use the appropriate type library. So here we see the QBFC 1.0 type library has been selected as one of the references. If I were going to use QBXMLRP, I would need to reference the QBXMLRP2 type library. So we're fine there. We're ready to do that open connection. Again, I don't have an app ID from the solutions marketplace, so I'm leaving it a blank string. And the app name that you saw earlier in the authorization dialog is SDK Essentials Sample. I don't care what mode, and I'm just opening the current file. Now, I'm ready to create that message set request to contain all the requests I'm going to send. And I call the session manager to create that message set request. This is important. Notice that the only object that actually gets created with the new function is the QB session manager itself. Everything else will be built as part of QBFC. It, each object within QBFC is a class factory for the objects underneath it. So then we've created that message set request, and I'm su supplying the country. And because this is just a demonstration and I know I'm talking to QuickBooks 2004, I'm hard coding that I want to talk QBXML 3.0. If this were a real application, and you'll see this in several of our Visual Basic samples, I would check what version of QuickBooks I'm talking to, what version of QBXML it supports, and I would choose the appropriate one for my application. Then I need to ask what customers there are, so I'm creating a customer query. And how do I know that this object is iCustomerQuery? Well, I'm using the SDK. And there's an on-screen reference. So I'm going to go to the QBFC on-screen reference. This is my French to English dictionary for QBFC. And the organization of all requests is based on what the object is in QuickBooks, a bill, a bill payment check, a charge, and so forth. So it's, it's what's the object, and then what's the operation I want to perform on that. So I'm looking for how do I ask what customers there are. And I see here all the customer related things and there's customer query. So I pull that up and I see that the top level object is an I customer query. And I see here that I can support, supply lots of parameters to say I just want a specific customer with a list ID or with a full name. Um, or I want a maximum number of customers, just active customers, and so forth. For the purposes of this demo, I'm just doing a very simple customer query request. I'm not going to fill in any of those parameters. So I set the query to be an append customer from the, the result of appending a customer query request to that message request set. That's the only request I intend to build, so I'm ready to build my response. And so I create an iMessage set response. That's the top level object we talked about earlier. And call the doRequests function with that specific message. Then that 
that response will contain a list of responses. Even though I only sent one request, I'll get back a list, and in this case it will have just one item in it, the, uh, the customer query response. So I need to grab that response list, so I get it out of the top level response as response list. In order to walk through that response, in this case just with the first element of the response, I create an iResponse object and get at the element that I'm interested in. In this case, I'm just getting at element 0. So that's the, going to contain the actual customer response. And first I need to make sure that the status code on that is 0. Or if I were going to be really protective of myself here, I might check that it's not less than zero, because less than zero indicates an error. Greater than zero would be a warning. But for now, I'm just going to do a status code, of, checking against a status code of zero. If I don't get a status code of zero, I'll post some kind of message to the user. And I need to check the type of that just to be defensive in my coding. So I grab the type of that response and make sure that it is, in fact, a customer query response. Then I'm ready to walk through that customer query response. Now since I've queried for customers and I haven't provided any parameters at all, it's distinctly possible, and in fact likely, as, as you saw a moment ago, that there's more than one customer in the QuickBooks company file. So I will get back a list of customer responses. So in that list, in that response, here is my customer list. And we can see that in the on-screen reference, if we look at the response, we see that the top level of the response is an I customer ret list. So coming back to the code, we have our I customer ret list here. And in order to get the actual customer ret list, I need to get the detail from that. Now let me just show you the, the power of IntelliSense here. I have a current response, which is the I response type. I hit the dot, and I immediately see all the functions that are available to me. In this case, what I care about is the detail. Now, if, if you're familiar with object-oriented programming, you're familiar with base classes and derived classes. The actual declaration of that detail property is that it's an IQB base type. And everything, all the responses and so forth, all the customer ret and so forth objects, are derived from that. So customer response.detail being assigned to a customer list, an iCustomer ret list, is actually casting from a base class to a derived class. In some languages that are very type safe, they'll have a problem with that unless you tell the language that you actually know what you're doing, that you intend to upcast. In uh, C Sharp, I believe, and Delphi, I would have to say as iCustomer ret list here after the detail in order to indicate that I'm upcasting. In C++, I put it in parentheses before it. From there, I walk through that customer ret list, one customer at a time. And again, looking at the uh, on-screen reference, I see that the iCustomer ret list is a list of iCustomer ret objects. So in the code, I have a variable to store the current customer in the loop, my loop index, and a string to build my SQL request to send to access. So I'm going to walk through that customer list from the first element, zero, to the last element, customer list count minus one. Build the SQL string to insert the customer ID, the edit sequence name, phone number, and email address. And then I call the customer list's get at function to get the, element, the current element in my loop. And for that current customer, I'm doing a couple of things. First of all, I'm verifying that it is a top-level customer, the actual customer and not a job of the customer. In QuickBooks, customers and customer jobs and even sub-jobs are all represented as the single customer object. So in the SDK, I get back a sub-level that indicates how many parents a given customer has. You see this actually in the customer ret in the on-screen reference. We scroll down and we see sublevel. I can click on that, and down below I see the number of ancestors is what sublevel means. So the customer with a job of name of carpet, and the full names is Jones Building 2 Carpets, 
has a sublevel of 2. We'll talk about that full name a little bit later. So making sure that I have a top level customer, just the customer uh, name themselves. Then I need its list ID and I call its get value function to get the, the value of that list ID. Similarly with edit sequence and with the name. Now I need to do something special. I can't be sure that there is actually a customer phone number. Not every customer has a phone number entered in QuickBooks. So if there isn't a phone number, then the phone object will be null. So I have to make sure that it's in Visual Basic, it's not nothing. If it isn't, then I can go ahead and get its value. One of the most common errors is actually trying to get the value of something that's not guaranteed to be there. And when you hit that dot get value, it causes an exception because you're trying to read off of a null object. If it's not there, then I go ahead and just put a blank string in. Similarly with email, and I'm all done at this point, so I can go ahead and a execute that SQL statement that I've been building throughout this loop, or in this iteration of the loop. That's all there is to it. It goes ahead and calls that insert into customers with the values that I pulled out of QBFC. When I'm all done with the loop, I go ahead and end session, close the connection, and set the session manager to nothing. Very straightforward. And our end result is a customer table that gets fully populated with the data from QuickBooks. So let's go back to the presentation.